Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is the 8th of January, 2012, and our guest tonight is David Risher, the co-founder of World Reader. Hi, David. Hey, Steve. How's it going? Really well. I'm really delighted that you've come on the show. Can't wait to talk to you about this fascinating program. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project, thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate for support. The Hack Your Education tour that I was on this fall is done, but there's lots to tell about uh, holding conversations about learning outside of the normal ways that we do so. So look for that coming up. Also coming up this year, many more virtual conferences. Last year we had about 100,000 virtual attendees. The recordings are all up for each of those virtual conferences. They are free, thanks to great sponsors. Uh, a lot of fun this year will be a school leadership summit in March, the STEM X Con, sponsored by HP. It looks like we're going to move that to July. Reform Symposium, conference number four in May, and a worldwide homeschool conference, also in May. Coming up on the Future of Education, tomorrow night we're doing a brainstorm on Google Plus communities and educational networks. Uh, this is of some real significance, uh, in part because it's becoming so easy to build peer-to-peer -peer virtual communities that uh, this is a skill that I think increasingly educators are going to value. So we'll talk about Google Plus itself, some of the positives and the shortcomings, and also other platforms, including Mighty Bell, which we'll talk about in just a second. On the 17th, uh, we're kind of a great show on student journalism. Um, on the 29th, Gary Obermeyer comes to talk about Deming. This is the first time we're, gonna, we're, we're going to have talked about Deming, and I cannot wait to do so. Uh, Deming was the uh, gentleman who went to Japan, largely responsible for post-World War II quality there. Not well known in the U.S. or as well known, but has a lot to tell us about the use of data, trusting employees, and uh, quality overall. Uh, Steven Bezruchka on economic inequality. Uh, this is a topic that really needs to get talked about in education. Carol Black comes back to talk about Occupy Your Brain. New on this list, Laura Weldon will talk about free-range learning. Howard Rheingold and his team talk about peer learning, what he's calling pedagogy. Paul Thomas to talk about poverty and the corporate takeover of education. Maurice Gibbons on self-direct learning. Gavin Dykes on student voice. New in the schedule, Roger Shank on cognitive science and learning. Coming back again, brilliant uh, discussions with him. We're going to talk about virtual book clubs with Ben Rhymes, who's running one right now that's fairly well known. And Jay Cross will come to talk about his book, Informal Learning. Lots more on the schedule. Some, some great names, committed but not on the calendar yet, so we'll have a lot of fun. If you have missed any of our shows, they are all recorded. Jim Knight was just brilliant the other night. Um, we, we were talking about instruction, but what we were really talking about was the parallel learning that takes place at all levels of the, of the education world, from student to teacher to administrator to parent. Adam Fry uh, came on to talk about uh, the commercialization and of education in ed tech. Uh, lots of fun. Cal Newport was back. Uh, anyway, lots of recorded sessions. I think we're up to close to 350, all available at futureofeducation.com. So this is a chance for those of you in our studio audience to tell us where you're listening from. Feel free to click on the star to the left of the map. You have to click twice and then click on the map. I'm in Park City, Utah, where we've just received a winter storm warning. So for the next couple of days, we're hoping to get some rain. Look, there's a couple in New Zealand. Feel free to, to place in the chat your location. At least we have a couple of international guests for a topic that's international. That's nice, David. <laughs> Wonderful. Great to see people from yeah. all around the world. It looks like Argentina, you said. So, yeah, fun. wonderful. Very fun. Wherever you're listening from and those listening to the recording, we thank you for doing so. There is a mighty bell space for tonight's show. Mighty Bell is the community content curation project uh, from Gina Bianchini. And I'm going to put that link in the chat right now.
and feel free to continue the conversation there. I really like Mighty Bell. I, full disclosure is that I do get paid by them, but it's a great project. And Gina Bianchini was one of the co-founders of Ning, and she does a great job. So, David, it was really fun to, to learn about you. Uh, there were some overlap and ties and connections. I'm sure if we drilled down, the six degrees of separation would, would shortly become one or two degrees. Um, do you want to give a little bit of a brief background on your own work and then what's led you to the, uh, this particular project? Sure. And in fact, let me do this. Let me turn on my video real briefly, Steve, so you guys can see me. Terrific. Hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually here in the Bay Area right now. Although, uh, as some of you know, I started Blood Reader. Well, actually, you know what? Maybe, Steve, it might be fun for me to tell you a little bit about kind of how Blood Reader got started, and then, uh, and then we can sort of leap into the, the presentation itself if that works. That would be great. In fact, we have an Ecuador tie because uh, our son went and worked at an orphanage in Ecuador for three months. So I think that's where you, that's well, that's the story I've heard, right? That's that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So my family and I. In fact, I was interested to see you're doing a segment on homeschooling because my family and I spent a year traveling around the world where we uh, we road schooled our two daughters. And uh, we spent some time in China teaching English there, some time in Vietnam, some time in uh, Australia, uh, time in New Zealand. I see a couple of folks from New Zealand here, uh, both in Christchurch and also in, uh, in the Auckland. And then sort of worked our way back around the globe and eventually found our, ourselves in Ecuador. And I'll just start to tell the story very quickly. We were at, the, at an orphanage there and had spent the day giving out towels and, and sort of basic materials. And at the end of the day, I, uh, we were walking towards the exit, and I saw a building with a big padlock on it. And I asked the woman uh, what was going on, and she said, well, that's our library. And I asked, well, tell me what's going on with the, with the padlock. And, and in fact, I could see books kind of piled up behind the, the windows and so forth. And she said, well, you know, the books take a long time to get here. By the time they get here, they're often out of date. And the kids have lost interest in what's going on there. And, uh, and so I said, well, well, gosh, can we take a quick look inside? And she looked at me and she said, you know, David, I think we've lost the key. And that, for me, really was the moment, thinking about the, the role the books had had uh, when I was growing up and I would go to the library you know, my mom would go to the grocery store and she'd drop me off at the library. Uh, or, you know, I studied literature, comparative literature at Princeton. Uh, or I worked for, for Microsoft first for many years, but then Amazon, that was just a tiny little bookstore. All these things kind of came together for me and I realized, well, this is something that I can, I can do something about. And that's really where the idea of World Reader, uh, where we want to put digital books in the hands of kids everywhere, kind of came into focus for me. So there are so many commonalities with our stories. You just got on a better track than I did because I had a similar experience in <laughs> Nepal with a guy at a school. I went out to visit a rural school of a fellow who often attends these sessions, and he showed me his library. And I asked the very question, which was, how long do these books last? And he said, you know, we're lucky because of weathering if they last more than three years. And that's my recollection of what he said. Right. And then we, he and I began to talk about the you know, the value of, a, of an e-reader. And then I think I mentioned in my email, I actually on the flight back was sitting next to a guy from Amazon who had yeah. some association with Kindle. And I said, you know, gosh, this would be a really cool project. And he said, right. well, I think, we're, I think we're doing it. Was that a name you recognized? I, I didn't know the name. I didn't know the name. But, you know, the difference there is I was very lucky. You know, I had uh, hired many of the people on the Kindle team. And so, you know, instead of, instead of my having to sit next to someone on an airplane by chance, I could actually call the guy up who ran Kindle and said, hey, how about if you, you, you make a small donation to us to help us get started? And um, it took about six months. And he said, you know, David, we don't really have a line item on our budget for, you know, donating Kindles to, for you to use in, uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa or whatever. But after about six months, they began to really understand that e-readers, because they're light, because they're portable, because they don't take much energy, and because they can get books from anywhere, you know, to anywhere on the planet, 
really could be transformational in the developing world. So that's how it all kind of that's how it all came together. But sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart, you know. And, and I was I was lucky that I had that experience to draw on. So I'm in big trouble. Neither lucky or smart. I mean, you know, what am I going to do? Well, so it was very interesting for me to look through the material because I I came at it with this sense of oh this is kind of a slam dunk, right? Ebook readers, the the magic of technology. And then the more I read, the more I sort of made mental notes of the various hurdles that you would have to get past to get to a place of having this project go large. Now, I also a couple of weeks ago met Nicholas Negroponte, and I think probably your paths have crossed, I'm sure. guessing, many times, and, and sort of uh, maybe some comparable difficulties, but the, but the significant difference for me is the simplicity of the idea. Right, the the, the trans, you you grew up reading. I grew up reading. Incredibly transformative practice, being able to read, and a device that just does reading seems like that as a starting place probably really makes things easier. I think that's right. I mean, you know, our idea is that we really, for the first time in history, can create a world where everyone has the books that uh, that he or she needs to improve. Uh, his or her life. I often say her life because, frankly, it makes often a bigger difference even to girls than to than the boys. And uh, you know, we could talk about the the, the comparison with, with the one off top for job program. I've met Nicholas and he and I have, have gotten a chance to talk about this. But I think you're right. I think the simplicity of it, even though there are hurdles and 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 those hurdles are significant. You know, it's not easy to start a project which involves technology and and maybe even more fundamentally that asks people to change their behavior. But, but in the end, I think we've had a lot of success. We've gotten uh, fairly big very quickly, in part because of the simplicity of the idea, the basic truth that, uh, that frankly, reading is good and that, and that more reading is better. There are a lot of people in the world who understand that. And the technology just becomes sort of an enabler to that. It's not, the, it's not really the center of the thing. Well, I've developed kind of a personal philosophy with regard to technology, which is, if the time spent figuring out the technology exceeds the value back, then you're, you're probably not getting somewhere you want to go, right? So the value of a simplistic ebook reader is that it gets you reading fairly quickly. And you probably don't have to spend a lot of time on the tech. However, you've got electricity, you have wear and tear on the Kindles, you have licensing, you have government issues. Uh, I just bought an ebook from Kindle the other day, and uh, I saw that there was tax on it, and I thought, well, this is interesting. I didn't, ex I didn't think I got tax. So then I went to Amazon and sort of read the fine print, and the taxing depends on the publisher. And I thought, this is a fairly sophisticated thing that has to take place, right? Every book with separate licensing, and you certainly deal with that. That's right. That's right. But you know what's interesting is that that is complex, and of course, you know, if it were easy, you know, it would have already been done. But at the same time, there are, there are real opportunities there too. For example, when we talk to publishers about those those sorts of issues, uh, it gives us the opportunity to say, well, hold on, you know, how many Hardy Boys books, uh, or Nancy Drew books, or Magic Treehouse books, or Atlases, or uh, War Horse? You know, these are all books that, that are in our program now. How many of those are you selling in Ghana or Kenya or Uganda or Tanzania or Malawi or Ethiopia or South Africa? And and they say, well, you know, let me spend a little time researching that for you. And and you know, I sort of say, well, look, you know, let me save you the trouble. <laughs> the chances are you're not selling very many at all. And so, because the cost to you is zero, to allow us to use that book, and because the cannibalization risk is is zero because your sales are so small in those markets, you should be willing to give us those books to use in our program for free. And so. That very complexity, you know, that the relationship you have to have with the publisher where you explain what we're doing and we're trying to put digital books in the hands of millions and millions of kids. But it also is an opportunity for us to sort of say, you know, let's do this in a way that doesn't cost uh, you anything and has potentially huge, huge impact on the world. So I want to give you a chance to go through your slides because we're getting questions in the chat from people who are interested in some specifics. And I think rather than address those now, let's let you kind of talk through the program and then see what questions are that come up after that. That sounds great. That sounds great. And 
what I'll do, and I, I'll see, I see some of those questions streaming by, and they're a great question. I'm going to turn the video off uh, just so I can focus on the screen and so can you. Uh, but maybe I can turn it on later when we do some questions and answers. And, and I'll go through this fairly quickly. I mean, we've already touched on a couple of issues, but I, I just want to give people a bit of context for what it is we're, we're, we're doing. This first slide here to me, this is actually a picture I took at a library in Ghana, is uh, sort of emblematic of the problem we're trying to solve. You know, we've lived in a world now for 500 years where, where books haven't gotten to some of the most deserving, some of the neediest people in the world for very basic reasons, for reasons of infrastructure and uh, at physical infrastructure. Uh, and and, and this, this is actually a picture of a library. And it, it's actually a very nice building, you know, and has, has a nice desk in it and, and so forth. But, of course, what's missing are the books. And it's, it's a very, very common story. In fact, this, I mentioned this is a picture I took myself. This is the only time I've been in this library, despite having been uh, to Adesu, Ghana, many times. It's usually locked up. And the reason it's locked up is because uh, there's no books in there, and, there, and therefore there's no interest in what's going on. So this is the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, and we're trying to solve it because there are hundreds of millions of children who, who have very, very few books uh, in their classroom and in their home. You know, the average number of books in a, in, a, in a home in Africa is three. This is in sub-Saharan Africa. And, uh, and half of the classrooms there have uh, either no books or, or children have just shared books. And, and this is a problem that we can solve now. And we can solve it using technology which is becoming less expensive every day and more ubiquitous every day. Both Ghana and Kenya have 80% cell phone penetration rates. Uh, you know, they're, they're, some people estimate there are more cell phones in the world than there are toothbrushes right now. So, so, so with cell phone technology becoming so ubiquitous and e-readers, again, which can be used outside, uh, which don't take very much power, and we can talk about keeping them charged and so forth, but at the end of the day, you can charge them for an hour and they'll last for a month or so, and connect up to the cell phone network. All of these pieces, as they come together, begin to help us create a world that's, that's a very different world from the one uh, that, that, um, that these kids have had to grow up with so far. This is, by the way, a picture of our kids in Kenya. We have uh, programs uh, in a number of different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'll tell you really, oh, and of course I should mention that, that these are distributed all wirelessly, you know, some through Wi-Fi and some over the cell phone network. And, and it's done in very much the same way that, that you would buy a book um, here in the United States. We use some special technology to, uh, so that we don't have to pay for those books, but, but that's, the same, uh, that's the same idea. So let me just spend a couple minutes kind of giving you the basics on how it works and, and where we are. And I'll, I'll kind of run through uh, the program a little bit. This is, uh, this is actually 817 Kindles. This is a picture we took just two weeks ago. Uh, this is a, of our, our operations center in San Francisco, which is where I am. Um, some of these Kindles, these are Kindles we actually just bought. Uh, these are all going to, uh, to a new program in, in Ghana. But we also get donated Kindles. Amazon has given us uh, now almost 2,000 Kindles, uh, but, uh, but we also buy quite a few. And then we, we send them to, to Africa. You know, typically we load them up in the United States, although some of the loading is done there in Africa as well. This is a picture. This is actually of our first program almost two years ago. Uh, and at the time, it was the largest order of Kindles that Amazon had ever fulfilled outside the United States, which was a whole crazy process in and of itself, which I'll, I'll explain if we have time. But anyway, we, we ship them into Africa, actually using a very low price contract we have through, uh, through DHL. Um, this is a picture of us setting them up. Again, this was two years ago. Um, I can date it in part because I had hair back then. But this was a, a, a school, um, a private school actually, that lent us their facility to do the setup. Uh, it was actually Thanksgiving Day, so the school was closed because it's an American school, but we used it to set the Kindles up. And we put hundreds of books on each of the Kindles. And again, I'll come back to what those books are in a couple of seconds. And then we go out into the communities, and we, we bring the community together. Uh, this is a very, very important part of the program. It's not just us working directly with kids. Uh, it's really us involving an entire community in each of our programs. And in fact, this meeting was, a, was early one Sunday morning. And I'll tell you a quick story. The, the, the priest 
who kind of runs the church where this community meeting happened and where we just kind of explained the, the program, stood up at the end and he said, you know, we have this terrible uh, saying in Africa, which is, if you want to hide money from the black man, you put it in a book because you'll never find it there. When we said that, the whole audience got very, very quiet. And he said, you guys are going to help us uh, solve that problem. And that's it's actually very interesting that, that we've now been in this community for almost two years. We've lost a grand total of five out of the 500 Kindles that we have in this community. And I think in part it's because the community understands so deeply the power of education and the importance of, of what we're doing, and they really look out for, for what we're doing. So again, I'll just skip through a couple of slides here to give you a sense of what it actually looks like. So this is now when, when we're in the classroom. Uh, this again, this is actually our first program ever in Ghana. Uh, these are sixth grade students, and they're reading Curious George uh, on these Kindles. And you'll see that, that which of course is a, a book that's younger than what you might expect them to be reading, but uh, they typically start reading in English at about fourth grade in Ghana, and so their reading level is a little bit below what you, what you might otherwise expect. I'll tell you a funny story about this classroom. This classroom actually, as you can see in the background, it's, it's in a place called Ayenya, Ghana, which is a couple of hours outside the, the capital. But you, you see that there's some books there. But when I first went into the classroom, I picked one of those books up off the shelf, and one of the books I picked up was The History of Utah, which, again, sort of shows some of the problems that we've you know, created for ourselves over, over the years. Is that we, even when we do get books to parts of the world that can, that can use them, often they're not the right books or the books that nobody else wants or cast-off books or what have you. Anyway, these kids are reading, and, and literally within you know, two minutes, back to your point, Steve, within a couple of minutes of picking up the device, they know how to use it. We've, we've, we, of course, train the teachers and we train the students, but, but in truth, you know, many of these students have used cell phones before, and, uh, and, and the technology just isn't very complicated, and so that allows people to get right to the important part, which is, uh, which is the reading, and I've got, I've got plenty of great stories about, about what that feels like, but I will tell you that it's pretty astonishing to watch the children read and then have them look up and say, can we have another book? And, uh, and you say, yeah, sure, let's download another. And that's just such a dramatic difference from, from what they're used to of, of maybe having to wait six months or more for, uh, for, for a new book to come. The last thing I'll say in this kind of section is that the books we're, we're putting on the e-readers are a combination of uh, some U.S. and European books. I mentioned Nancy Drew and Royal Dolls books and, and uh, Atlas and Guinness Book of World Records and so forth. But we also now have hundreds of African titles as well. We've now worked, and this gets back to your point, Steve, about how this is a bit of a complicated project. We've worked with about 30 different African publishers so far to have them uh, contribute books to our program. And we pay the, the publishers for them, but we pay them about a dollar a book, which of course is, is less than the, the price of a, of a printed book. Uh, but we recently wrote a check to an African publisher named Longhorn for about $10,000, which is absolutely fantastic for them. And it's very important for us that we support the local African publishers, but frankly, that, that we also give the, the, the children uh, books that they're used to reading uh, and that their teachers want them to read. So you'll see books there in Key Swahili, uh, some books in English. We also have textbooks. We've got most of Lincoln name textbooks, many of the Kenyan textbooks as well, two of the bigger countries where we work. So we, we, we really try to spend quite a lot of energy making sure that we're, we're putting books on the kids that the kids really, uh, really want. And this is what it looks like. This is one of our programs. This is actually over in Kenya. Uh, this is actually our, our third program that we're running now, uh, just outside of, of Nairobi. So let me pause here for a second and just note that we're about 3,000 kids and 200,000 e-books. And maybe, Steve, you probably have some questions, or maybe I can take some of the questions that have scrolled by, and then we can kind of continue on if that, if that works. Yeah. In fact, I would love to uh, – Jenny is desperate to know about uh, the, the funding here. But before we go to that, quickly, I do think you've got a, a cell phone app program, right? We do. We do, and, and this was one of the early decisions we made, is that, and again, it, it's, it's maybe a different path than the one laptop per child path, uh, which was, uh, I would characterize as very much sort of a, a, a kind of technology-driven project, at least to start. Whereas we've taken more of a content-driven approach. So our view is technology is going to change, it's going to evolve, 
already the e-readers we use today are three generations beyond uh, the ones we started using, you know, those, those early white ones that you saw a couple of slides ago. And then we also have a cell phone app. And this, the cell phone app is actually much bigger than the e-reader program, um, but it's also earlier. It's more of a beta test for us. We have about 500,000 uh, people reading on the cell phone app all around the world, and they're reading many of the same books uh, that we have available in the e-reader program. And the biggest uh, country there actually is India. And the second biggest is Nigeria. Uh, then South Africa, then Ethiopia. And then we have several uh, Latin American countries that have represented as well, although most of our uh, content is in, is in English so far. So we're, we're sort of device agnostic. We start with e-readers because we think they're great for long-form reading and they work very well in the classroom. But we know at the end of the day, you know, more people will have cell phones than will have e-readers, and so we really want to be able to, uh, to be on both platforms. So Jenny, hang on. We're going to get to the financial. Um, David, what, how much of the learning process as you've watched the kids pick up these readers and begin to use them, how much of the learning is peer-to-peer -peer and how much, do they, um, how much do they need instruction? I haven't asked that question well. Let me rephrase it. Over the course of time, do you find that there's a lot of interaction between the students themselves or how much do they need to be guided by the teacher? So that's a great question, and uh, it, it changes very quickly. So at first, uh, you know, the kids look to the teacher for, for, for guidance or for leadership. But uh, very quickly, just be, A, because kids are curious and, and smart, and B, because we encourage this, uh, they, they move beyond the teacher. So I'll, I'll say a couple of things to this topic. First, we decided early on that we didn't want these e-readers to be thought of as precious devices that got locked up uh, in the school. Instead, we encourage the kids to take them home. And so, and they do. In fact, later in the presentation, I've got some pictures of kids literally walking through the market, uh, pictures that we took as we were kind of finishing lunch one day, actually. And, and, and then we went to some of the kids' homes and saw where they read uh, and did their homework at home. Um, so my point here is that the kids very quickly begin to think of these as their own device. Uh, even though uh, officially they're school property or world reader property, we encourage the students to think of them as their own uh, and, and be responsible for them. And consequently what happens is they not only read to themselves, they read to their brothers and sisters. They read to their parents. In fact, an amazing moment is talking to the parents and having the parents, many of whom are not literate themselves because they grew up at a time where there was really very little schooling. Uh, tell us, my kids are reading to me at night, which is just an incredible sort of inversion from what you, you typically think in any case. Uh, and then they, and they teach each other. You know, uh, now, they're textbooks, and so the textbooks uh, on the, in the program, of course, that's used in the school setting, and that's the teacher standing up and down the students and using them just like a, any other book. But very quickly, the students teach each other and, and work with each other. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's just a book. It's just reading. And the technology really is, uh, there's just not that much to it. So, you know, in about two minutes, you know, I, can, I can teach you how to use a Kindle. And, and you know, of course, you already know. But, you know, anyone can teach anyone else how to use an e-reader pretty fast. Do you think that Sugata Mitra and Nicholas Negroponte are on to something when they believe that the technology is enabling kids to learn without teachers? You know, I don't, I mean, so yes, but, and, and here I guess all I mean is in most successful classrooms I've seen, you have three basic elements. You've got, you've got teachers, you've got students, and you've got uh, instructional material. And it's, there's no doubt at all that, that students a lot of times can run faster than the teacher. There's also no doubt that not every student is capable of doing that or, or, or is interested in doing that. And so, you know, the model that we have is one which I would say is, uh, you know, it supports the classroom environment as it exists today, particularly in the developing world, where the teacher really does play a very, very significant leadership uh, role. So, I don't know, I, I guess I sort of have mixed feelings about that. I, I sometimes feel that there's this view that says, well, teachers don't matter anymore because the technology can do it all. And I, and I don't actually think that's right. I think, uh, I think there's actually a real leadership role and a, a sort of an example setting role that teachers will continue to play for a long, long time. And certainly the, the technology we're using 
you know, it's not in, in really by any stretch of the imagination meant to replace a teacher. Now, that said, I love the fact that our students are meeting outside of classroom, and I love the fact that our teachers tell us this is making my life better. It's making my life easier. My students have done the reading. By the time I get there, I don't have to actually, you know, simply recite what's in the book. I can take them beyond that. So I guess I see them as more complementary than substitutes. You're getting positive response in the chat. Okay, so tell us about the financial model. A uh, dollar per title, five dollars per title, a seventy-nine dollar Kindle device, and I'm guessing that based on the average wage per capita in these countries, that these may seem like relatively small dollars to someone in the Western world, but they have got to be astoundingly high for others. You know, so I'm going to say a couple of different things about that. And if you don't mind, I'm going to flip through a couple of slides here. I don't actually remember where the slide is. You know, if you don't mind, Steve, let me take a slide or two more, and then I'll come to the economics there, and I'll make sure to get to exactly that question. And give people Absolutely. a little bit more more context of where we're operating. Um, so the side you're looking at here, these are the, the, um, the, the countries where we are and the places within the country. And, and to your point, I mean, we're operating in parts of the world where, uh, you know, the, the GDP per capita, the annual income, uh, might be $1,000 uh, know, or less in, in, in some of these countries. But I will say that despite that, you know, Africa is developing a real middle class. And, and, and by a real middle class, I mean a, a sizable middle class, hundreds of millions of people. You know, there are a billion people on the continent of Africa, and you might say that 300 million of them are, are considered middle class in, in some way. Now, this doesn't mean that they have an enormous amount of money, but it probably means they have a cell phone. And it almost certainly means that they value their children's education because they recognize that that's one of their the ways forward. And so uh, I'll come back to the funding in a second, but one of the surprises for us is again that theft has been quite low and that when we talk to parents about you know, would you be willing to actually pay for this at some point in the future some of them say you know what yeah we would pay for it the same way we pay for a cell phone you know we would pay it you know a dollar a month something like this but we would be willing to pay for it in the way that we're uh, willing to, to pay for cell phones i'll bring this next slide up as well because it's kind of interesting and it gets you to exactly this point this is literally mail we i got this mail on january 2nd so just a couple of days ago but it's quite representative of the sort of mail we get uh, from around the world every day. And I'll read it here. It says, I'm interested in how much it would cost to provide Kindles for 1,500 students to learn in the classroom. And then they go on to ask some specific questions. What are the logistics? Um, how, do you, how do they keep charged? Uh, how do you get stories and so forth? But the reason I put this slide up is because we are, our funding, you know, we are roughly 80% donor funded right now. And that's everyone from USAID uh, to uh, the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation to individual donors. You know, I'm a donor myself, but also um, uh, some other early Amazon employees or donors, some Microsoft employees or donors, and then, of course, philanthropists all over the world are, are, are donors for us. That's about 80%, but about 20% comes from what we call program funding. So these are often schools, sometimes they're sponsored schools, sometimes they're, they're, um, they're independent schools, uh, but they're, they're almost always public schools, but they might have an independent financial sponsor. And they, they'll pay us $10,000 or $15,000 to run the program in the school for them. So it's maybe more information on what you were specifically asking about, but, but, but this, this idea that uh, you know, donors can fund World Reader, and they do. It's very important to us. Uh, we can't be a nonprofit without donor funding. And, and we have thousands of individual donors as well as some, some larger, as I say, corporate and, and, and sort of more philanthropic and foundation level donors. But we also have partners who pay for the program, and uh, and we like that quite a lot. It reduces our fundraising load a little bit, but more importantly, it kind of it puts some some skin in the game for for, for people. And then I think I have a slide up here that talks a bit about our cost structure. I do. Look at that. So this was our budget uh, in 2012. So we, last year we raised about uh, a little under a million and a half dollars. Um, and we put about 300,000 ebooks in total into kids' hands. Um, this 300,000 actually will be the number by the end of, of February of this year. So this, the simple math here is it costs about $5 a book in total. 
And that's in total, total, right? So that includes the cost of the e-readers, the cost of shipping, the cost of lights, the cost of cases, uh, which are often donated. Um, the books, again, many of which are, are donated. And, and we expect to get to half a million books, um, you know, over the next couple of months. And, and we're still quite young. So anyway, again, maybe much more information than you were, you were asking for. But we, we sort of like our economics quite a lot because the technology keeps getting less and less expensive. Of course, e-readers now cost you know, $60, 70 $80, uh, where they used to cost a couple hundred dollars. As we grow, we get economies of scale in many different ways. Uh, and, you know, the fundamentals of, of digital technology uh, and, and digital books in particular means that, that over time they'll cost less than printed books. And so we, we kind of like how that all comes together. And then we like the fact that, that partners sometimes are willing to pay for this program because that helps us uh, keep our, our the amount of time we spend on fundraising so we are. Are you pausing for me to feed you a question? I think so. I, yeah, I'm pausing to take a breath. I realized that was a, a lot of information. <laughs> so, if you want to ask, so some of the questions, questions yeah, some ahead. of the questions specifically were: Are the schools paying? Um, is there? Um, uh, um, I understand that it's five dollars per ebook when you sort of amortize everything out, but. Is there a dollar amount that a, that a local school pays, and, and how are you choosing which schools to work with? All, so all great questions. So the, um, you know, I'll start with the, the last one, how are we choosing? In, in some cases, we actively choose the schools ourselves. So for example, in Ghana, we went to the government of Ghana, so the Ministry of Education, and we said, look, we've got a, we've got a big idea and we'd love to test this out uh, in, in Ghana. And after some back and forth, they said, that sounds like a great idea. We'd love to really be a test bed for you. And so right now, we're in six schools in Ghana, and uh, those are schools that the government actually chose for us. And they're the schools where we've done, I'll flip through a couple more slides here, they're the schools where we've done the most measurement and evaluation. We got a $100,000 grant from USAID uh, which is the U.S. bilateral agency, to test, uh, to see what happens to reading scores over the course of the year, uh, of the school year. And, and that we've done in Ghana because there we're working very closely with the government and, and we got the authorization to do it with them and so forth. And you can see here the effects. And, and basically what happens is that the kids' scores go up uh, about eight points more than, uh, than they did in the control schools. But that's Ghana. So that, there we're, we're, we're very hands-on. In Kenya and Uganda and uh, Tanzania, all of those countries, those are schools that have come to us and have said, we'd like you to operate in our schools and, um, and, and, and we'll even pay you. And the, the cost of a, of a, we call it a world reader kit, which has about 50 e-readers in it, Translates to about 5,000 books. Uh, yeah, 5,000 books, which is enough for you know a, a good-sized classroom. Um, that the cost of that is about $10,000, and that's something that the school typically pays. Now, again, some of these schools have, even though they're public schools, they have they have private sponsors in some cases. Um, so it's really a, a, a blend of all of the above. In some cases, you know, we choose the school uh, when we want to do measurement and evaluation. In other cases, the school chooses us, and then we evaluate to see whether the school was a good candidate because, of course, they have to have a certain amount of infrastructure. They've got to have someone who wants to uh, sponsor the program financially, but also operationally. You know, there's, there's got to be a teacher who's ready to uh, to learn how to kind of administer this program. And then we work with them. In fact, we have a whole area of our website, which is, um, and we have a whole group of people who are sort of account managers, and, and their job is to help support uh, support these programs. And that, that picture a couple of slides ago of the 800 and some uh, e-readers, they were getting ready for a new um, kits program we, we have where we're sending those out to different schools across sub-Saharan Africa. David, are there other benefits that are harder to measure but that you feel are, are taking place beyond sort of um, English language test scores? Are you finding that there are other ways in which this has impact that you uh, you like to notice, but may not be measurable through a standardized test. 
There are, and, and this is one of the, actually, in fact, I have, I have a slide on a couple of them that came up through this ILC report. Um, and, and I can mention these guys, you know, these are on the slide, everything from, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that families can share in, in reading and, and, and so forth. And, and you'll hear, I've got a video on a, a little bit that we can uh, listen to that shows the talk that, where you hear some of the teachers and the students talking about the effect it's had in their life. I'll say it's actually, it's, it's really quite remarkable though, the, the, the difference that all of a sudden having access to a real, uh, almost a portable library has is, is I mean, as you say, it goes well beyond just, you know, what happens to your, your test scores. All of a sudden, you know, one of the, the kids in our program, I um, actually have a, a picture of her a little later in the presentation. Her name is Okanta Kate, and she has read well over a hundred books in our program over the last 18 months. And that's just a night and day, you know, sort of a quantum change from what she'd had access to before. And now her stated goal is to become the most famous writer in the world. That to me is just remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. And that's not, I mean, of course her scores are going up nicely and she's doing well at school, but really the benefit there is uh, that, that her horizons have been, her, her eyes have been opened to, to her possibilities. So that's a sort of an aspirational, almost a societal level if you, if you sort of, you know, aggregate that up across hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of students. You also see some very small things that are, I just think, absolutely fascinating. I mean, you see kids, literally, when their, their teachers are not in the classroom, you see kids breaking out their e-readers and reading on their own, which is fantastic to see. You see boys coming up to you and saying, you know what, books always used to intimidate me, but I like reading on this because it's a sort of, a, it's almost a toy, it's almost a gadget. You know, I, I just, uh, I, I enjoy um, uh, using it in a way that, that I always was intimidated by, by books. Another very subtle thing is, uh, you know, the kids in a lot of our programs, no surprise, no surprise, don't have very good eyesight. Now, you know, in the United States, you don't have good eyesight, you go get glasses. Well, guess what, they don't have money for glasses. And so uh, the fact that you can make the font bigger or the fact that you can turn on text to speech and sound out words that you, you couldn't otherwise sound out um, and, and your parents uh, don't know because again, they, they likely don't know how to read. You know, these are, these are you know, tiny little things that you don't really spend a lot of time thinking about. But then when you see over and over again, the kids being able to read in a way that they, they clearly could not have read before uh, having these e-readers, it really is quite, uh, it's really, really, really quite remarkable. And then the last thing I'll say is that the teachers tell us that one of the things they love is not only does it, it, it make the kids feel special uh, and, and it gives the kids a little bit of an introduction to technology because, of course, you know, the, the schools don't have computer labs, so this for them is kind of another step into kind of the computing world, but they like the fact that the teachers have access to all these books that the teachers didn't have before, including teachers' guides. And what the schools are telling us is that this is allowing them to attract better teachers, right? Because all of a sudden it's a, it's a benefit to, to teaching at one of these schools. So, I mean, look, I don't want to say this is a magic bullet to all of life's problems, you know, and our program, we have challenges just like any other program does. But, but there is something very, very nice to see the uptake that this has had, the excitement that the teachers and the students have and the genuine enthusiasm, and, and frankly, just the, the pure number of books that these kids are reading, uh, it's just, it's, it just puts what they were able to do in the past, um, you know, frankly, kind of to shame. It puts, puts everything kind of at a, at a new level. So Larry Ferlazzo is a name you probably don't know, but he's a teacher in Sacramento, California, and he's been on the show a couple of times, and he started a take-home computer program for the Hmong po population there and showed really measurable gains in literacy amongst the family members in addition to the students. That's sort of stunning to me and to think about the impact here on the families of your students as well. It's, it's really pretty extraordinary what happens at the family level. There's actually been some pretty good research on this that suggests that, uh, and this, this, is, this, this research predates our work, but it suggests that just having books in the household is roughly, and, and something like 50 books in the household, is roughly equivalent to having one of the parents uh, have gone to university 
In other words, you having books is roughly, you know, if you dab into university, great. If you dab into the university, but you have books, that's roughly the same sort of equivalent educational load. And um, and then and then what ends up happening is, you know, it's not just the kids that benefit. The whole family ends up uh, benefiting from sort of the shared knowledge of this. And as I say, one of the wonderful things was listening to the parents talk about how excited they are to have their kids be reading to each other and back to them. So these things. Again, I, I don't, I really, I, I sometimes find myself, you know, kind of getting so excited that I, I, I probably sound a little bit, you know, over-enthusiastic about it. But I really do think, you know, there's so many problems in the world that when you sort of peel back the onion and look at it, you realize that if you have a, a more educated population, ultimately, maybe not tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but in, you know, months, years, and certainly within a generation, you will really, really change the world. I know I come from a biased position because I run an interview series right, largely based on books. But it seems to me that in my own personal study, the conversation after reading the book is as critical as the actual reading of the book. Are there ways that you're seeing good practice or encouraging certain practices around kind of the, the sharing of knowledge that takes place after the reading? So that's a great point, and and frankly, that's an area where you know we all have more work to do. And what I mean by that is, these are classrooms that typically they've had to share textbooks, uh, and they have very very little sort of leisure reading, you know, pleasure reading. Most of the reading that happens in the classroom is textbook reading, and therefore, when we come in, again, we have textbooks in our program, and the textbooks are very useful to the teachers immediately. But a lot of the times, the teachers don't really have a very good model for stimulating those sorts of conversations that you're talking about. And the students don't have really a model for that either. And we've been, I don't know if surprise is quite the right word, but, but we've, certainly, we've certainly noticed that. So one of the things we do now is we have, we call them uh, out of classroom uh, experiences, OCE. And they typically take place on Saturday. And they're, they're really kind of reading groups, book groups that we put together with, our, with volunteers that are in the market. Uh, a lot of the times they're, they're university students uh, in Accra or in the capital city of, of whatever country they work in. And they'll come out and read with the kids and then just talk to the kids. But I will tell you that's an area where we're really just beginning to get uh, educated ourselves. And we work with a foundation in Ghana called the Olinga Foundation that's been doing literacy work for years. And, uh, and, and we're doing something similar in, in Kenya with a group called RTI. I think that's going to be kind of our next level of learning ourselves is how to make sure that, of course, for bright kids and for kids with, um, with, with, for whatever reason, sort of deep levels of motivation that kind of comes naturally. But I think that type of conversation you're thinking of, Steve, unfortunately, it's still relatively rare for, for kids to be able to have those sorts of deeper conversations about things they've read uh, just because they, they just don't have the practice. So Christy asked a question which isn't directly related to this. I'm going to give it to you, but if you'd like to defer it, you're welcome to. She wants to know if you could describe what you believe to be critical for the future of, the, of, future of education in North America, maybe based on some things you've seen in this work. You know, I have to say, I, do, I mean, I have, of course, I have opinions about it um, based on my own experience and, and you know, my own kids and so forth. But it's it's funny. It's not an area I really feel expert in by any means. And it's, uh, I guess I'll, I'll I'll address it maybe by sort of flipping the question around a little bit, uh, and then maybe I can come back to it. But you know, people sometimes ask me, how come you're not doing the same work in in the United States? And which I, which of course is a very fair question. But my answer is that the, the sort of the, the, almost the business person in me wants to go where the impact is the greatest, where the, where the bang for the buck is the greatest. And the need in the developing world for books is so large that you can see as soon as you start satisfying that need, there's an almost insatiable appetite for more. Whereas the, the sense that I get about the education system in the United States is is not that it's the lack of books is really holding by and large. Of course, this is a generalization, and I know there are pockets where this isn't true. But but lack of access to books hasn't been a fundamental inhibitor to to sort of strong education in the United States. Um, 
uh, and, and therefore our program wouldn't maybe have the same impact because, uh, because it, it doesn't satisfy that, that, that need in quite the same way. Now that leads to an answer to the question you're asking, which is, well, okay, you know, if it's not lack of books, then, then what is it? And that, I, honestly, I'm not really sure I'm the right person. That, that may be one where I have to come back to another one of your seminars and listen to someone else's uh, uh, point of view on that. I mean, I, I can tell you my own experience, and I can tell you what I've heard other people say, but I don't know that my direct experience uh, is, is, is so relevant there. Fair enough. So Laura uh, discusses the fact that there's a bonus to an ebook reader, that if you're not interested in something, you can just switch to a different book, which brings us to this issue of uh, choice and the quantity of books available. Is there, have you discovered any correlation between the number of titles on an ebook reader and the value to the reader. Is there a point at which too many titles becomes too confusing, or does that even matter? So that's a great, great point, and that's absolutely one of the things we've been learning about ourselves. So we originally put, uh, let's say, 150 books, to use a round number, on all at once. And we did find, exactly to your point, that it actually was a bit overwhelming to some students. And so now what we tend to do is, first of all, we categorize them much better. But second of all, we, we put new books onto the e-reader typically every couple of weeks. We do something which we call a push, so we, put, we literally push out new books. And then remember also the students can choose books on their own. So one of the nice things about the, the, the Kindle is because it uses the 3G, you know, the GSM network, the cell phone network, the kids can literally go in and get first chapters and samples uh, just in the same way that you and I can. And they can get free books and at any point in time. There are you know, thousands of free books available to them. And then we can actually look at that data in the aggregate and use that to try to figure out what books the kids are more interested in. By the way, they also like the active content, uh, the word games and flashcards and, and so forth and so on. So we're sort of trying to titrate there. You know, we, we don't want to put too few on because that's not interesting. But we don't want to put so many on that it's intimidating right from the start. We want to sort of get it just right. And we found that if we, about 100 books, which is still, of course, quite a, a big number, but if we put about 100 books on, categorized some uh, U.S. books, some local textbooks, some local storybooks, um, that that's, that feels about right. And, and, and the, the, the schools uh, have a huge say in that. You know, of course, we have our recommendations based on what we've seen work in other schools, but we also ask the school, what would you like? And I'll tell you that uh, one of the really interesting things that happens is, you know, the students, when they first open the e-reader, they first turn it on, they'll see these books. For example, one of the girls in our program in Uganda looked at, at uh, a book called The Blue Marble by a Ugandan author. And she looked up and she said, you know what, I don't even think I knew that Ugandans uh, wrote books. Because up until then, the only books that she had seen had been imported books, books from, uh, from outside of Uganda. And so it's, it's, it's really quite interesting and, and frankly sort of startling to see uh, what the kids respond to. And, and then once you hear something like that, then you say, oh my God, we've got to go and find more Ugandan authors and make sure that their books are digitized and put them in the program as well so that the kids can read uh, their own authors instead of just uh, imported books. One of the pieces of information I gleaned today was at some point you used some fairly well-known soccer players to um, in interest or involve the kids in getting into the books. I, or maybe it was pictures on the screens or something. How much, okay. how much do you feel that you need to do that kind of social marketing for the program? You know, that's another great question, and, and actually it leads me, I want to show you the video as well briefly, because um, just coincidentally, one of the, uh, the, the kids in the, in the video wants to be a, a football player, a soccer player himself. You know, um, I guess the short answer is we want to do whatever it takes to get kids excited about reading and create a real culture of reading. Now, to a certain extent, as we were saying before, just putting the books on the e-reader, uh, teaching the students and teaching the teachers, already that gets you, you know, let's say 70% of the way there. But I know that from my days at Amazon, I, I guess I didn't mention too much about my own background, but I was the vice president of marketing and merchandising at Amazon for many years. When I joined the company, it was a very small company. It was about a $16 million company back in 1996, this was, uh, January of 97, actually, uh, just a bookstore. 
And, uh, and, 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 my, and the reason I joined, by the way, is because I love books, uh, I always have, uh, and I've been working at Microsoft for many years, and so I thought this was a great way to bring two of my passions together, books and technology. But in any case, Jeff Bezos you know, brought me in his office during the interview, and he said, look, we want to create where you, uh, a place where you can find and discover anything you want to buy online. And uh, that is going to include video and music and toys and tools and electronics and, and you know, everything. And, uh, and, and that's what he hired me to do. That was my, my job for many years there. And when I, when I left, it was about a $4 billion company, so we grew up quite a bit. But what I learned through that process is that changing people's behavior is really quite hard. You know, people have habits. And, and if there's no culture of reading, then you've got to make it easier and easier and more and more exciting and less and less expensive uh, to read. And you have to do all of those things. If you only do one or two of those things, you, you might not get there. But if you do all three, if you make it easy and you make it, make it relatively inexpensive, uh, you know, and, and of course you provide the you know, great selection and content of great books themselves, you've got a shot at it. So to your point, Steve, yeah, we, we um, formed a relationship with the football club of Barcelona um, about a, six months ago, I guess. And they allowed us uh, to use images of some of their most famous players, including Lionel Messi, who's probably the, most, uh, the best known soccer player in the world, on the e-readers. And the reason, and, 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 and we do it in a way that you know, they're personalized for the kids and they have messages for the kids about reading, every book is a goal, and so on and so forth. And the reason we do it is, yeah, again, it's, it's to appeal to, you know, there's some kids for whom you know, books are naturally exciting. Uh, there are other books, there are other kids for whom it takes a little bit more, and, and that's something that we're experimenting with just to see uh, kind of how it works. So we have about three minutes left. If we show the video, my guess is then, as a courtesy, we always finish on time. If we show the video, okay. my guess is we're going to be out of time. We can put the link to the video in, or if you'd like to end on the video, I'd be quite happy to pull it up. No, you know what, let's, let's, why don't we put the link to the video in, and instead I'll just, uh, and, and the other thing I'll do, particularly because my director of communications will kill me if I don't, is I put this slide up, uh, which tells everyone, you know, how to, you know, to come to, if you can come to our website directly, worldreader.org, or to follow us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, there's also my own um, uh, Twitter feed there. And there you'll find all sorts of videos and pictures and stories and, and everything else. There's, there's uh, an enormous amount of information. And we try to be really quite active about sharing uh, what works and also what doesn't work because we know, you know we're not going to be the only people in the world to come up with this idea. Uh, we just think we're, uh, we're, we're, we're doing some, uh, some good in the world by sharing information and by getting kids more books. So we, we try to share as much information as possible. And there are lots of videos on the website. Again, I put the link in, but I'm going to put it in here again. It's uh, worldreader.org, right? That's right. And why is it plural in the tweet, in the Twitter hashtag, the Twitter handle? <laughs> uh, well, only because someone else has the, the at worldreader uh, ah, uh, Twitter handle. So. Don't you hate that? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, when that happens, but I will. There's so much we didn't get to, but uh, it's very nice that you have so much of the story up on the website. So if you're interested, uh, worldreader.org, there's lots and lots that will keep you busy, as it did me for several hours. Uh, I really want to thank David for coming on the show. David, that was really terrific. Yeah, well, I really enjoyed it, Steve. And, uh, you know, honestly, as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm passionate about this and, uh, and, and can talk for hours. So. If, uh, if folks on this conference want to send me a piece of email uh, and have a follow-up question, I'm david at worldreader.org. Uh, you know, I will also say I'm not always the best at, at uh, answering email. I think, Steve, it took you a couple of tries to get this uh, going. But so if I don't respond, um, don't take it personally. Just send me another note. And, uh, and I appreciate everyone's interest. I really do. Uh, a huge fan of Microsoft Access. It was a big, significant part of my life. I'm a huge financial supporter of Amazon.com. You're living the life I would like to live. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At least I know it's possible. <laughs> Very kind of you. Well, thank you for your support, Steve. And thanks to, uh, thanks to all of your, uh, your participants, your, uh, your, your community as well. Really, really great to see the work you're doing. 
Thanks, everybody, for being here. Don't miss tomorrow night our conversation on Google Plus communities and educational networking in general. And then uh, next week, um, student journalism as 21st century curriculum. Lots more coming up. Thanks to David. Thanks, all of you, for attending. Have a good night or day, depending on where you are. Bye now. Take care, everyone.